All right. Good evening. Welcome to the program. You're listening to The Soapbox here on 90.9, 104.1 WMPG, Southern Maine's community radio from the University of Southern Maine. My name is Eric Poulin. Thank you very much for joining me this evening. And with me in the studio is uh, uh, Professor of Economics at the University of Southern Maine and author working on uh, a book coming. What was the title of the book? Fall of the Paper Plantation. Fall of the Paper Plantation, a history of... Uh, labor issues here in Maine. Michael Hillard, welcome to the show. Thanks for being here. It's great to be here. Always love to be on WMPG, and it's a special delight to be interviewed by a former student. That's right, yeah. And you're a former host here at WMPG of uh, Big ten, Talk. Ten years on Big Talk. Yeah, yep. great. So it's great years. It's good to have you back in the studio. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, this is uh, the community's airwaves here, so uh, you're very welcome to join the conversation. We have um, an economics expert here in the building. Yeah, all so you got to do is call 780-4909. That's right. 780-4909. Perfect. <laughs> <clears throat> and especially I want to make a shout out to any of my students, current or past, who are listening tonight. I did promote uh, my appearance here. And uh, don't feel shy about uh, showing off your knowledge of neoliberalism and asking a good question on air. Please do. This, the neoliberalism is an area that I, I feel like it's a little bit uh, hazy to me, so perhaps we'll, we'll get there. Um, sure. But, uh, so as we were just discussing, I'd like to sort of build on conversations that have been um, progressing over the course of the show here. In, and uh, as listeners may or may not know, we spoke to Dr. Richard D. Wolf, who will be here on campus on April 23rd. Two weeks uh, from tonight. Two weeks from tonight. He'll be here. He's a Marxist economist, and um, his wife, Dr. Harriet Fraud, will uh, be delivering a speech the following day. Is that right? Ten, uh, noon sharp in the University Events Room, uh, seventh floor uh, at the library here, the Glickland Library. And Wolf will be speaking in Talbot Hall in Luther Bonney, 630, 830 on Wednesday evening, the 23rd. Great. So I guess my first question for you, uh, Michael, is... I have a I have a libertarian friend, and you know I think when you hear some sort of don't we all yeah <laughs> that's exactly what Richard Wolf said. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think um, left leaning economists tend to portray the economy as sort of a big pie, right? And as inequality has grown, you've got a an increasingly limited number of people taking a larger and larger slice of the pie. So my, my libertarian-leaning friend says, but a nation's wealth is not a static quantity. It's mm -hmm. not a fixed quantity. So basically the, the idea is that if you want to be wealthy, you can create the wealth if you just apply yourself uh, hard enough and take it for yourself. What is the, the problem with that perception, or is it accurate? Uh no, it's not accurate. It's not even accurate in describing what people who you might characterize as being the left have to say. I mean, we pay attention to the fact that there's data that shows that over time, uh, in the last 30 years, for example, um, majority of people have produced more and more and more and seen none of it. Um, and their economic lives have become more precarious. Um, I ran through State of Working America and printed out a bunch of charts. I'll just give you one of them. Um, Job-based uh, health insurance uh, in the last decade uh, went from 70% down to 58%. So it's not just that uh, the rich have gotten richer and the poor have gotten poorer. It's, it's trying to understand why this is happening, why it's a departure from a trend where for 100 years before that, uh, as the economy grew... Wages did go up, and they went up for a lot of reasons. Partly it was productivity, but partly the workers had unions that could insist on getting a share. Um, but the libertarian perspective uh, is sort of like you put on a pair of glasses, and you're only allowed to see two things through those glasses. One is individuals, and the other is the state. <clears throat> the only powerful institution that can take away from anybody is the state, and individuals can just go into the marketplace, which is this kind of great sorting mechanism in which if you approach it right, you can get great things. Um, and that denies the existence of all kinds of institutions and forces in society that a libertarian uh, essentially refuses to recognize. Um, <clears throat> what are those sources uh, of, of power? Um, well, uh, the most the strongest uh, Institutions in our country are large employers. 
Uh, and the United States has a history of having much larger employers because of the size of our economy than any other country in the world. So we've had large, powerful corporations going back to the late 19th century who um, are very against any modifications to a social Darwinian world. So they have fought tooth and nail against having any government presence or union presence in the economy. And things were so bad in the 1920s uh, that we had a depression that came out of inequality, um, that workers lived in communities where they were governed by corporations in a dictatorial fashion. People didn't have the right to vote. They didn't have the right to associate. They didn't have much rights at all. And um, <clears throat> there was a kind of uh, liberal revolution that took place in the 1930s when people finally said, this is America. There are all these standards of being a citizen and being a member of the economy that are, are supposed to exist, but they don't exist in reality. Um, and so the improvements in wages over the last 120 years came from, yes, the creative, you know, evolution of a, a market economy with entrepreneurs and, you know, companies that innovated and all that kind of stuff. But it also came from an intense uh, uptick in what labor could produce, coming very much from the effort of people working on factory lines. And the only way they were able to realize a share of that was through, you know, what can only be called class struggle. Uh, the organization of a strong labor movement in the 1930s and 40s that forced business to accept a different set of terms where productivity went up, wages went up. That was really unprecedented. And as long as labor was strong and, and the government policies surrounded that, like Social Security and so forth, strong minimum wages, we had 30 or 40 years in which people who went out and worked hard in the economy could count on being rewarded, right? Um, and that did not come from a free market economy. It absolutely did not. It came from a uh, what economists then and political scientists called countervailing power between government, unions, and business. And the neoliberal turn, that's what political economists call it, in the last 30 years where unions have been pretty much crushed, uh, where the government increasingly has adopted you know, the old policies of not supporting either regulating industry or uh, uh, redistributing income to the poorest, um, you've seen a return to all the same problems. So you can go out and work really hard in our economy uh, and see your wages not go up at all. Um, and I teach labor economics. That's my current course this semester. And <clears throat> when you try to explain income inequality, there are two parts to it. One is how the rich gotten so rich, and that has everything to do with the financial takeover that Wall Street affected in our economy. That's at one end. At the other end, uh, what's happened is the dismantling of job opportunity. Um, and uh, so employers and what's going on at USM is just a perfect example of this pattern. They want to replace high-paid, middle-career people who may be very productive and skilled with uh, much less paid younger people who may be talented and may acquire skills pretty quickly, but they're hungrier. Um, and they're willing to work for much less. Um, and so, you know, out of that, whether it's the opportunity to move up in a job over time, whether it's the opportunity to get health insurance in your job, whether it's opportunity to, to be able to build a retirement for you, all of those things have eroded dramatically in the last 30 years. Um, and so the idea, then you had the financial crisis and recession on top of that. And the idea that just by going out and pulling up your bootstraps, you're going to get ahead flies in the face the fact that many people out there pulling up their bootstraps and they're still naked, you know. <laughs> they're still struggling. Right. Um, uh, the phone number again, 780-4909, if you want to join in the, uh, in the conversation. Um, so, Michael, I wanted to ask you about this, too, particularly given your expertise and knowledge of uh, labor history. What, how, how do you see it in terms of what's happened in this country with the general public's, particularly working people's antipathy to unions. What has happened to change their perspective? Uh, I mean, even just recently, uh, I forget which auto company it was. Volkswagen, Chattanooga, Tennessee. That's right. And they tried to unionize and it was voted down by the yeah. workers. So what is the story behind this antipathy? Well, you know, uh, Again, if you look at it as something that's evolved over history and it's in the context of institutions that have power, 
Um, it's not like just people are going out in the town square with their flyers and, you know, and debating in local libraries. That's not what happened. What happened in the United States is that, um, you know, I, my origin story starts with, with the New Deal. And the New Deal, as I talked about, was a moment when unions uh, got strong, when government stepped into the failure of the free market system to revive it, right? That's what happened. The Great Depression was the failure of the free market system. And <clears throat> when government and, and, and unions, labor unions, gained power and where popular support in much of the country was with labor, big business looked at this and, and to them they were horrified. And they were like, well, what can we do about it? Well, politically, they couldn't do much about it in the short run because somebody like Eisenhower was going to accept Social Security and the right to unionize and the government legislation that gave workers the rights to unionize. Um, so borrowing from a very uh, important, uh, widely cited um, Italian Marxist intellectual named Antonio Gramsci, who wrote the theory of uh, political hegemony in the early 20th century, uh, he had this concept of a war of position. And a war of position is one in which uh, you're not in a position to go out on the battlefield. So kind of behind the lines, you're trying to create the conditions to be able to win the war. And that's what American business did in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s. And what they set out to do was um, to first build up uh, uh, right-wing anti-union um, economics. Mm -hmm. uh, and they funded... Uh, Friedrich Hayek and the Chicago School and all these very, very free market, anti-union, anti-government economists at all the highest levels in academia. Who went out and destroyed economies in other countries, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, if you read like uh, Naomi Klein's Shock Doctrine, it's got a good account of it. I mean, yeah, they, you know, dictatorship was imposed, you know, through the murder of a democratically elected president in Chile in 1973. Mm -hmm. And a bunch of Milton Friedman students went down there to do their little play thing of, uh, you know, imposing free markets on it and causing a lot of inequality and disruption to the society. Uh, we tried to do the same thing in Iraq. Mm -hmm. uh, which was a, a hilarious disaster of some proportions. Um, so, uh, so they built up a, 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 an intellectual infrastructure of anti-unionism and anti-government thinking. They built up um, political networks, uh, very much centered around uh, Goldwater. Um, and there's these terrific books that are coming out by historians that are trying to understand the decline of labor and the rise of conservatism. And there's so much of it. I mean, I go to conferences and I meet and I, I'm on panels with all these authors because I write about this subject. Uh, but I teach entire classes on this because there's so much to learn about it. Mm -hmm. So this this huge picture of all the different parts of it. So they, they use Goldwater as a uh, as an attractive spokesman. Um, and they also cultivated one of the great um, progenitors of this, you know, anti-union, anti-government uh, ideology was a guy na named Lemuel Bulwer, who historians have known for a long time. He was the mm, director of labor relations at General Electric, and he got brought in after a strike was lost to the union in 1946. And he came out of a marketing campaign background. He was a marketing expert. Mm -hmm. And he created this, you know, system of ideological domination within the workplace with 200,000 employees to just drench them in this free market, you know, uh, unions are communism, uh, the market is the only thing that matters kind of thing. And uh, along the way, he, he said, you know, it'd be really good to have like an internal, you know, spokesman, somebody who's charismatic. And he hired this washed up actor named Ronald Reagan. <laughs> and so Ronald Reagan got his career as an anti-union spokesman in one of the largest companies in the country that uh, produced textbooks that everybody who was an employee had to study these textbooks. And it was all just, you know, gibberish about uh, unions are worse, a bigger threat to American way of life than the Soviet Union. And Reagan began his political career essentially as an informer during McCarthy era. Well, you, you know, that was a feature of what he did, but <laughs> but him becoming like the uh, the you know the cipher, the voice for um, this new ideology that was a take no prisoners. We're gonna we're gonna we're gonna conduct a long war in which we're gonna ideologically defeat the idea that anybody besides business has a place in society mm -hmm. at the democratic table. Uh, and we need to construct a, a conservative movement, and that was a much larger project. How do you get you know workers to be have antipathy towards unions? One of the things they did is that they funded uh, politically this effort to stigmatize unions as being uh, mobbed up, 
and they used the very visible Im- image of Jimmy Hoffa, who was pulled by uh, some right-wing people in front of Congress in the 1956-57 era and held up as an example of, you know, this, this corrupt uh, person. Um, you know, they, they first went after unions for, for being directed by communists. They got rid of all the communists. They routed, routed them out of union, put a lot out of unions, put a lot of them in prison in the early fifties. Um, but the majority of American unions were actually politically moderate or conservative. So how do you go after the construction trades? Well, you say that they're all mobsters, and it turned out like maybe three percent of the American unions had had mob control which was a detriment to the workers. It was not something like the workers were like, hey, we have a right to be a mobbed up union. They, they didn't like it either. Um, but it was an exception rather than the rule. But there was, you know, kind of the Bill O'Reilly's of the day who had places in newspapers where 10 million people would see on the front page, um, you know, the same anti-union columnists who just made up all these lurid stories. So, you know, I would say that so much of this has to do with a... Um, you know, if we have the richest, largest, you know, employer class in the world and have had it all along, and if they have spent 60 or 70 years trying to fund an intellectual and uh, public relations war against anything that has to do with labor, um, it's not surprising that over time that they've actually won. Mm-hmm. Um, and they've won to the point where once you get rid of unions, people don't have experience with unions. What do they know about unions? They hear some stories, and they see some things on TV. So recently, I had my students look at the question of uh, food stamp abuse uh, because Jon Stewart did this wonderful thing. uh, uh, Well, actually, no, I'll say Fox News did this wonderful thing, which is, you know, the food stamp program has grown quite a bit because there are so many poor people after the Great Recession, right? And we're a country that, that has a program that says that we don't have people starve because we have more food than we know what to do with, right? It's just kind of all a no-brainer. Um, but, you know, the Tea Party faction of the Republican Party and Fox News and all those folks, they just, you know, food stamps is all about somebody who goes in and somehow or another walks out with, you know, Alan's coffee brandy and a carton of cigarettes instead of food or maybe a few, you know, cupcakes or whatever, and then they go out and get in their BMW and drive off. And this kind of urban legend is one that they have so much fun with because people, I mean, you know, my students all know, know the story and a lot of them believe it. Mm-hmm. And I had them research, you know, what was actually going on. But the, the kind of beautiful part about it is that the way in which Fox portrayed it is that they portrayed, uh, they found a guy who is a surfer in California uh, named Steve Greenstone or something like that, who's an aspiring rock musician. And he was just really proud of the fact that he got food stamps and that he bought lobster, frozen lobster with it. And so they held this guy up as this is what the American food stamp program is. And the thing is, is that if you're trying to win a cultural ideological war, colorful stories and anecdotes win the day. They violate every rule of knowledge that a social scientist or a journalist knows about. But that's, you know, in propaganda, you get to do whatever works. So, you know, the antipathy of many workers in this country right now towards unions comes from a 70-year propaganda campaign. And, And when you get to the point where, you know, in the last few years, a lot of that antipathy has been towards public employees, right? And, you know, so... Teachers unions are corrupt. Somebody knows that there's a teacher at the school who can't teach anymore and the union's protecting them. And then, you know, the fact that everybody's wages and benefits have been driven down to such a low level to hear that people can retire before they're 65 and that they have really good health care. They're teachers who made $36,000 a year with their incredible talent. I mean, these are people who are not not rich at all, but the fact that somebody has benefits becomes a matter of envy. So unions are something that gives, you know, and and I really think that the issue with uh, thinking about class and inequality that we face, if you want to get at the truth, which is what I want to get at, is that it's much easier to compare yourself to somebody down the street that you might see than the abstract, you know, upper, you know, upper one-tenth of one percent of the Koch brothers and all these people who have 10 homes of 40,000 square feet and fleets of cars and, 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 and the, oh, by the way, they can buy a good name by giving to all the um, 
symphonies across the country and founding medical research centers for cancer. They have so much money, they, they can never spend it. So they make themselves like the best people on the planet. They live in this incredible way. And people don't compare themselves to them because they never see them. What they see is the person down the street who might be hard on their luck and be on you know, benefits or somebody who's a public employee and has a union and has better benefits than they do. And I work harder than they do. And why do they get... You know, so I mean, I, I really think that, you know, so much of the battle right now is the cultural battle of the terms of how we understand our society. Okay, you're listening to Michael Hillard, professor of economics at USM here on the Soapbox on WMPG. And Frederick, you are on the air. Go right ahead. Hey, I'm, I'm happy to be on the Soapbox. I, oh, good. You're welcome. I love having, I love having a Soapbox. I was very much enjoying listening to uh, Professor Hillard. Thanks for the, uh, the explanation. I go back to um, was in college in the early 1970s, and I remember I grew up in an area in western Pennsylvania that was very strong uh, labor support, and even Republicans would have never crossed, um, you know, the picket line, so to speak, or would have crossed their allies, which was labor at that time, but. The uh, conservative movement, <clears throat> you know, um, at that time with the Goldwater um, drubbing in 1964, decided to get together and devel develop a, um, a uh, pro-business, uh, anti-government, anti-labor, anti-working class um, campaign. And we haven't seen any movement from progressivism or liberalism that would remotely approach anything um, that could be considered a campaign or a, consens a consensus of a, an ideology. Um, we've, we've fallen into these silo um, ways of thinking. You know, we have feminism and women's rights, and we have gay rights, and we have the environmental movement, you know, and immigrant concerns. But we've not been able to understand that all of those concerns demand a functioning democracy, a good governance that the left, I feel, must get behind. Uh, I, ag um, I agree very much, Frederick. Thank you very much for your call. And I think that's a point that uh, others have been making for a little while as well. Ralph Nader, Adolph Reed Jr., they've talked about how the left has essentially been decimated for a number of reasons, but not least of which is McCarthyism happened and uh, basically conservatives managed to equate any kind of solidarity or movement to communism and have managed to, to vilify that. But really, the left has been factionalized and marginalized, and there doesn't seem to be any sort of cohesive vision uh, uh, or any kind of uh, effective leadership to move us in, um, in, a, in, a, in an effective direction for, for the country. I wonder what you think about that, Michael. Uh, well, that's, um, I think there was a show a long time ago called The $64,000 Question. <laughs> mm -hmm. And that's $64,000 question there. And I have to say that in many ways my career as a teacher and a scholar is devoted to answering that question. Uh, and, you know, for 20 or 30 years, I, I mean, I couldn't agree with how Frederick put it. Uh, more, which is that you have um, you have progressive activists who essentially look at single issues, um, and as some of the really smart uh, left labor historians who are amongst some of the best intellectuals in the country, go out and b find a book by Nelson Lichtenstein, any of his books, and you'll just like you'll rock your socks off. Um, he's got a book on Walmart. He's got a book on um, the history of American labor in the 20th century. Uh, he's got a book on a 600-page biography of Walter Ruther, who is the greatest labor leader of the 20th century. Um, all kinds of stuff like that. But in any event, you know, I think the point is that uh, the I, I see a lot of the ingredients of a left being created right now that just have not been present in any kind of significant form. Um, I think, first of all, the overriding issues in our society are class issues, economic class issues. And I think the overriding problem that we face in any quarter, whether it's in our political system, whether it's climate change, whether it's you know our, our economic lives, is corporate power. And, and I don't think that that's something that is a fringe idea anymore. I think it's something that's really coming to the mainstream. By the way, this is a great pitch for you to come here. Rick Wolf, Richard Wolf, um, 
who's one of the leading left intellectuals in the country, who has a positive uh, uh, vision for the country around worker democracy. Uh, 6.30 to 8.30 in Talbot Hall on uh, Portland campus, free and open to the public. And that's, again, two weeks from tonight. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll be introducing him because he was one of my professors in graduate school. Um, so, but y you look at the fact that there's a movement of, uh, uh, uh coming out of, uh, labor, labor activists and labor institutes, and there's some really good, uh, radical labor graduate programs that are, uh, either evolving, emerging, or being created around the country. And th those are kind of the laboratories for creating, creating a, a positive left. Um, but I think, you know, around Walmart, around the fast food workers, um, around a growing sense that that we have to find economic alternatives to corporate America, I, I really think that in a, in a protean form, uh, the food movement, the foodie, livable, you know, locavore movement. Um, I'm teaching a class right now where we're looking at the fact that sustainability for food includes everything except for livable wages, mm -hmm. uh, and I'm actually uh, in conversation with the mayor's office and some f local food entrepreneurs about trying to do a livable wage project. So I really think that the class issues coming to the fore, I think a lot of young people who are being educated places like this, I mean, what's going on with our USM future movement, you know, the students coming forward is, is that they really have gotten a very good education in being able to think critically about class and understanding the need for, for you know, what most people would call left. And, 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 and you know, they're learning it uh, in a cauldron of fire in terms of the attacks on, on, on their, their professors and their programs. Uh, and I think that they're not folks who, um, are, I mean, none of my students come away from my classes thinking, well, boy, it was good to learn all this groovy liberal sh stuff, and I'm just going to go out and find a career for myself. They, they, they want to know how to be part of a movement. Mm -hmm. uh, and I haven't had that in the 30 years that I've been here until recently. Well, and I've got to say, I'm glad you touched on the USM thing because we've got to hit it before the uh, show's up, and we're r rapidly running out of time. But I'm, you know, I'm a relatively young guy, and my generation, I'm a member of the generation that's the first, really, in a long time to be doing worse than our parents' generation. And, right. you know, we've played by all the rules. We've gotten our educations and the, the jobs and the uh, upward mobility is simply not there. And people are upset about it. I think that gave rise to the Occupy movement. And yep. It will give rise again. So let's just touch real quick. We've got a couple minutes, a minute and a half or so. Um, what's going on tomorrow in Monument Square? Well, it's the next edition of the, the brewing movement that uh, started here at USM. It certainly pre spread to uh, UMaine. Orno. Um, it involves a lot of faculty and I think other people in the community. Um, and it's an old-fashioned march and teach-in. And it's really about defending public higher education. And I think calling into question that um, in a society right now where our university system is sitting on hundreds of millions of dollars of reserves, um, a lot of it committed to build buildings and stuff like that. But do you want to build buildings and then not have the professors to put in them? Um, we're what we just heard that there's a 1.1 billion dollar destroyer that's going to be built at Bath Ironworks for what you know to defeat Al Qaeda out and on the high seas. So you know we're in a situation where we're still the richest country in the world. Our GDP per capita is fifty thousand dollars per person. Um, there's the wealth there to support higher education. We used to be a society that believed in doing great things in part through government. That was the 60s, 70s, 50s, after World War II, fighting the Cold War, putting a man on the moon. Uh, and I think this young generation here that I see are recognizing a need that if they want to see a society like that, they got to go get it themselves. And I think that's what that rally is about. Well, thank you very much, Michael Hillard, for being here. It's a pleasure. We'll have to have you back because there's a lot more to talk about. Um, I, I always think in complete 30-minute thoughts, so I'm happy to come <laughs> back and do it again. And uh, again, that's tomorrow. The, uh, the uh, teach-in and protest will be happening in Monument Square. There are free buses for faculty can and I, students. Can I make a correction? My yes. understanding is, is that it's starting um, at Longfellow Square. Oh, okay. Uh, and there's going to be a march down Congress Street, and they're going to wind up at Monument Square. So if you're there at noon, I think you're supposed to be at uh, about Monument Square. And you can go to at, uh, at Main Future, uh, hashtag Main Future, rather, okay. uh, to find that. Great, and there are buses for faculty and students if they want to, leaving from the Woodbury Campus Center, and it will, it will transport yeah, them. Yeah, qu quarter of uh, 12 and 12. That's right. Okay, thank you so much. Stick around for Byron here on WMPG. Thank you to Ed for engineering. My name is Eric Thanks, Ed. Cohen.
Uh, this is The Soapbox. I'll see you next week. We'll have guest Pat Taub, an activist and feminist, on the show. Thanks for tuning in. Whenever it's possible.